Hello and welcome to chapter 2 of the King's Indian Masterclass, which is all about 9b4, which is the bayonet, this move right here. As always, there is PGN files in the description below, so you can study the theory on your own. And with that out of the way, let's jump straight in to the bayonet. Now, the bayonet with b4, as white, your approach is very simple. You don't want to waste the time moving the knight and defending on the king side in view of the attack that's going to come, you're not wasting that time. You're going immediately for the attack. And in many ways, this is actually the move that brings black the most amount of trouble in the King's Indian Classical. And actually, many players avoid the King's Indian Classical as black because of the bayonet. What I'm going to be recommending in the video today is the main line of the main line, which is knight h5. The point of this will become very clear very soon, but I do want to quickly offer an alternative if the variations that I'm going to show you in the video today are not appealing. The move a5 here is super interesting and you get into some very interesting variations. I was very close to recommending this move instead, but I have stuck to the main line knight h5 and this is very logical. We are utilizing the fact that white's knight is still here. They haven't wasted the move like they typically do, bringing the knight to e1 or d2, and therefore this square on h5 is ours for the taking because the bishop and queen don't have contact with that square. Okay, now in this position, it's important to understand one of our main ideas with the knight. We want to play knight f4 and hit the bishop. If we can win the two bishop advantage, in the King's Indian, not only are we still going to have a deadly attack, but when the center opens up because of f5, because of c6, our two bishops will almost guarantee at least equality and more often than not, a victory. Therefore, knight h5, knight f4, this is a serious threat. White needs to respond here. The main option is rook e1, bringing the f1 square for the bishop to hide on. But an alternative is the move c5, very similar bringing the bishop to c4 idea, bringing another square for the bishop to basically hide on. So the two main moves, c5 and, and rook e1, very logical, just bringing the bishop to safety. So we're going to begin by looking at rook to e1, the main move. Now again, knight f4, very nicely met with bishop f1, and therefore we go f5 here. The intention uh, is basically the other point of going knight h5, which is to unleash the pawn to f5 and begin our kingside attack. Now one of the benefits of the knight staying on f3, an additional benefit is that without committing itself to the passive squares on e1 or d2, it has the potential to swing over to g5 and become a very dangerous piece. It's threatening now to come on e6. It's also unleashing an attack on the knight over here with the bishop and queen, and that is just threatening to win a piece and crash through. So the move that we have to play here is the retreating knight f6, but this is okay because by moving the knight to h5 and bringing it back, we've gotten to play f5, and therefore there's pressure in the center and we have enough space. Now you might be wondering, why is the knight not just jumping to e6? Isn't this a really dangerous situation for us because we have to give away the bishop for the knight? And you're right, this is basically the inequality, the imbalance in the position that the entire variation of the bayonet that I'm recommending hinges on. Which player can utilize this unbalanced position better? White has the two bishops, but in exchange, they have a fairly weak pawn on e6. They have lost a lot of their control in the center, and we're doing very good with space on the king side and good development. So who will be able to basically use these factors to their advantage more successfully? One thing that I want to emphasize, though, white is not going to make our life easy. If they play knight to e6 first immediately, that's really good for us, because although the position does have much imbalance to it, they've immediately shown their hands. They've basically cashed in too early on. What they should do to squeeze the position for as much as they can get, they're going to sit their knight on g5 for as long as possible. They're going to force us to waste moves by playing either h6 or potentially bishop h6 and kicking the knight away. And then, only then, they're going to bring the knight to e6 and then force us. So we're going to eventually have to waste some time going h6. So in this position, instead of cashing on too early with knight e6, they're either going to go f3 or bishop f3, solidifying their center, which, as I pointed out, is their biggest weakness once the knight comes to e6. So f3 is what we're going to start with. This is the main move. We're going to go king to h8 here, a very quiet waiting move. 
we're again asking them, do you want to come to E6 now? And if they do, perfect. They haven't waited as long as they can. This is quite inaccurate. Their best option is to wait for us once again to commit with the move H6. The other benefit, though, of, of king to h8, instead of just sitting around, once they do bring their knight to e6, we take, they take. Eventually, if our queen manages to, to recapture and retake that pawn on e6, you can imagine this diagonal opening up. And so the bishop can come to c4, the queen can come to d5, there could be some issues. So getting out of this diagonal preemptively with king to h8 is usually a good decision, a good waiting move to, to go ahead and throw at white. Now, in this position, rook to b1, white continues with their attack. Uh, you know, the ideas of this position haven't changed fundamentally. White is still going for this queenside expansion, queenside attack. And in theory, we still want to make pressure and add pressure either to the king side, but as you're going to see more often in the bayonet variations towards the center. And we do that by eventually playing the move c6. But first, we have to put a question to this knight. We go h6. We force them to make a decision. And again, knight to e6, basically the only option. And now we're going to take. And we got to the kind of key position that I mentioned where we have these imbalances. Now, we're going to first continue here by taking on e4. And now we're going to play the move knight to c6. Now, our idea is to bring the knight to d4 and then capture on e6. You don't really want to capture with the queen because the issue is that they come knight d5. If you capture with the queen, this is a very common way to lose. Do not make this mistake. And if you capture the knight, this is a similarly dangerous mistake because they solidify their pawn structure and they have no weaknesses and a very scary pawn here. So we do not attack the pawn with the queen generally. We're going to attack it with our pieces, with our knight. In this position, knight to d5 is the move that they make. And once again, we do not want to take. We also don't really like to keep the tension here because giving them the option to take whenever they want could be problematic. You can certainly imagine if the bishop is forced to take, we're going to hang over here on h6. So the best option is actually knight g8. Now you might look at this position and be like, Aren't we making so many concessions? But again, this is a long game. We're maneuvering the knight. We're very soon going to bring it back to f6. We're going to put pressure on e6. We're going to expand with c6. We have made very small concessions early on, but we're going to fight back. And objectively speaking, black is very good here. And practically, black scores very well. So knight d4, we're hitting over e6. The move now is queen to g4, defending and attacking, and we go g5. Now, this is one of those positions that gets incredibly tactical. So you need to memorize these moves that might seem like a, a big task, but every move so far has been very logical. White brought their bishop into the game, their queen defended and attacked, and for us, we centralized the knight, we avoided the trade by coming to g8, and we've basically stopped the pressure that white had by going g5. Now, in this position, the most precise, the most accurate way for, for white to continue is to go h4. So we're going to look at this first. There is alternatives that we're going to consider a little later, but let's begin with h4. We go and play knight to f6. Now that the queen is on g4, it's the perfect time for the knight to come back because again, if they take, we're kind of happy with that because they've ditched their center. And if they don't take and they have to move their queen, we got knight f6 with tempo. Now again, we're not taking, we're not basically uh, justifying their center here. Instead, we're going to take on e6. Okay, so we're up a pawn. They do definitely have compensation. They have a strong knight, but we've actually managed to more or less equalize. But again, very tactical position. And th the way that it typically continues is they're going to take, we're going to take on d5. Notice that if they take on h6 here, this is the most uh, precise way for them to continue. Because if they, by the way, just take in the center here, like this, we're going to take with the knight. We're very happy in this end game because once again, we are up a pawn. Super happy. We're only playing for two results, a draw or a win for black. So the main move after they take, we take, is to first throw in this one, taking on h6. We're hitting the bishop, threatening some dangerous ideas on g7. So we have to continue very precise bishop to f6, and now they take. Now, we're going to play bishop h4. You can see again how tactical and double-edged this position is, but again, the moves should make sense. White has taken here on h6, forced our bishop to f6. We're now attacking and, you know, skewering the queen and the rook. 
they're going to play queen to g4. They're attacking the knight, but more importantly, they're keeping eyes on g7. And here we continue by taking on e1. They're going to take on e6, and this kind of fizzles out into a very dynamic but objectively equal endgame. You go bishop f2, and there's two options for white. Either way, you get a very interesting position where white has uh, very immediate threats, but you're up a pawn. And, and this imbalance is really what makes this endgame so intriguing. Now here, even though the king is in the line of the fire of the rook, you cannot utilize that because of your weakness, and something like this would be checkmate. Therefore, you're going to instead go queen to e7 and just defend. King to e2, this is the main line. But what I really recommend you do in these sort of positions is to play against the engine, against Stockfish with these endgames. And you're going to see as the black side, there's many different ideas you can go for. And the position is so unique that I think just getting experience in it is going to be quite important. Now, as a general idea for you, one of the things here is that this queen is super important to stay on e4. If it ever moves, then that means that your queen can join in the attack because you no longer have to guard over mate. So, for example, one of your ideas could be to go c6 and then d5 with the intention of dislodging this queen. And again, that would be deadly because that would allow your queen to join in the attack, no longer having to defend. And this is actually going to lead uh, directly to some checkmate. Um, and, and therefore, if we take a step back, you know, white has to be quite careful here because, again, they have the two bishops, they have what looks like a deadly attack, but we have ideas of our own. Now, the other option for white is to indeed step to h2, and again, this kind of transforms into a similar endgame where eventually probably the rooks will trade uh, or, or your bishops will trade. And again, it's a very interesting position. The king being on h2 means that typically we're going to have more attacking chances because, for example, now you can see that the queen is hit. We're threatening to swing over the rook as well. And in fact, we're already winning here because, again, we're keeping an eye on their attacks. And this is, in fact, deadly as well. Here we can continue by going rook g4 and end the game on the spot. So some very interesting endgames will arise. Objectively, both king to h2 and king to f1 are equal, and, and white can hold, but I, I find that practically an extra pawn up, and with a very weak king, we have good chances as black. So very interesting endgames, I'd urge you to explore more, but now let's take a step back, and the final thing that I want to look at in this f3 variation is a game example, and this game here was played by Rajabov, and in this position after g5, which is a reminder is what we go for, Instead of going for the very important, the very critical h4, in the position, uh, in the game that we're looking at, the move queen to h3 was played instead. Now, this is far less critical, but it's still an option that makes sense, and, and white still has chances here. And so I want to look at how, uh, in the game, Rajabov went about uh, playing and eventually winning. So c6, we're attacking the knight, forcing it to move. And now we can reactivate either our knight or our queen to this f6 square. The knight can come via e7 into the game as well. So many options for the knight. Eventually, we take on e6. They can't really hold on to this pawn. We go queen to d7. We trade off some material, uh, as you'll very soon see. And we, again, open up the position. Uh, this move d5 is quite important in these structures because this is where we hold our advantage. Again, we won the pawn in the center, so we're not only up a pawn, but we also have more control in the center. So we want to use that. d5, this is sort of the moment where, as a King's Indian player, you move away from the attack on the king side and you transition into more pressure and a bigger attack on the middle of the board. Now, eventually, black crashed through here. Essentially, just by opening up the file, there wasn't much more to it. You obviously looked at your opponent's ideas, but we have such a safe structure here that it's difficult for white to crack through even with the two bishops. So in this position, with the pin over here, the king decided to move. If you take the rook, the knight comes into the attack. Uh, I'm going a little quick through these games, but uh, admittedly, already here, black is better, and it's just a matter of conversion, so the end game... Um, has kind of already been reached, or at least the middle game, and so the, the opening stage has indeed passed. You can see the queen now can slide via f3 
to g2. This is a deadly configuration and white will very shortly lose. So if we back all the way up, this is how you play against f3. You utilize the weakness of the center to eventually regain that pawn by this very nice knight maneuver and then play c6 and d5, expand in the center, go h6 and g5, defend on the king side, and you're going to do just fine. Bishop f3. This is a very common alternative that you're going to see. And here we go for very similar plans. We go c6. Um, notice that h6 is again a move that you can kind of play. You can go h6 here immediately and then later go c6. These will likely transpose. The main move is c6, then h6, and we kind of get that same position. Now in these positions, when the pawn is already on c6, on one hand, we don't have the same ability to attack the pawn with the knight, but on the other hand, we're far safer to attack the pawn with the queen because they don't have that same trick of going knight d5. So we're still going to eventually win this pawn. It's just going to be a little bit different the way that we do so. Anyways, the main move here after they take, we're going to take back on e4. They're going to take, we're going to take, they're going to take. And again, we expand in the center. This is where we're strong in the bayonet positions where the knight comes to e6 and we take it and chop it off. We're better in the center, so let's use that strength. And indeed, because of the fact that we have this huge center, black is objectively better already. We've equalized and more. We're already looking at being better because this pawn is extremely weak, so we're going to be up material as well. The bishop can become very powerful, and the center, again, is our biggest strength. So b6, we basically block the bishop. We're getting ready to bring the rook into the game. This is another one of Rajabov's games. Queen to g4, very strong, putting pressure and defending on e6. And now e4, opening up the bishop. And this game, actually, after queen to c7 and rook to d8, just basically centralizing the pieces. You don't have to immediately try to go and win back the pawn. This is another one of those positions where as black, it's very difficult to lose this. As long as you keep everything defended, white can't crack through because you have a superior center. So you're basically again playing for two results, a win as black or a draw. Now in this actual game, white decided to go for the draw here and black accepted it. Admittedly, I think that black could have gone for a bit more of an ambitious uh, mindset and not gone for the draw here and try to play on. But I think both players had in mind a very typical draw that arises from these type of positions where essentially you put the rook on f5, you go and expand with h5, and then you have this repetition where you kick away the queen. And this is typically uh, how many of these games end in a draw. Um, but again, black had many different options. They could try to expand on the queen side. They could you know, continue to defend, over defend this pawn and then bring the knight into the game. There's many options, a very flexible setup. If the rook ever moves or the bishop ever moves, we're pushing through. This is one of those setups that's extremely dangerous and white has to play with a lot of precision. Now, we're going to back all the way up to this position because rookie one is what we just looked at, which goes into those positions where the knight comes to e6. And a different option is the move c5 here, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video. Now, this is less common, but it actually is still very strong. You want to bring the bishop to c4, as I mentioned, in response to knight to f4. And you're basically continuing with the attack. This is very much in style of the bayonet, where you don't make any moves on the king side. You just blindly go for your attack on the queen side and hope that it works. We continue with going knight to f4. This is a position where even though the bishop can come to c4, we still want the knight on f4. And the reason for this is with the bishop now dedicated to c4 instead of f1, there are more weaknesses on the king side. So this is one of those situations where we're justified to commit our knight to f4, forcing the bishop to the queen side, and now go for a more strong attack on the king side. So we go bishop g4 here. We continue with the attack. And then we go g5. We're continuing with the attack. Notice, by the way, h3 was not an issue here because g4 uh, hangs the pawn and then hangs the other pawn and we win. So this is not really... Uh, working tactically, but g5 is still a good option not to give the room to the bishop because again, h3, g4 is not an idea, but to bring the knight into the game, right? We want to continue expanding on the king side. So there are alternative ways to play these positions. You can play more positionally, you know, and defend a little more on the queen side, but generally speaking, white is going for such a dangerous attack and they're moving all of their pieces to this side of the board 
we need to, to basically return the same level of ambitiousness on the king side. We have to play very aggressively. Bishop g4, g5. Now, h3 was played, bishop h5, and here bishop takes f4. The idea is if they don't trade uh, in this position, and let's say they play bishop e3, we can continue now by, you know, going f5. We can go g4. Um, you know, there are many ways for us to continue pushing through with the knight being that supporting piece in the attack. So they decided it was worth it to take the knight off the board in this position. But now we take back. And not only is the bishop really, really strong, but we have the square now on e5 that is very much at our disposal. So we have, again, that control in the center that really defines these bayonet positions. And for this reason, we have already equalized. We are fighting for more. So here, after a5, we have a trade in the center, and the queen comes to a5. We are equal in material, but again, because of the superior placement in the center, because of the fact that on the queen side, we're roughly equal, I, I would say, black is doing better. Now, in this position, black decided to give away the two bishops, but in exchange, be able to now take control on the square in the center, so transitioning one advantage into another. We then have the rook coming to the c-file, which is clearly where all the action is going on. We now have f3. You can see these positional advantages of the knight in the center, the space on the king side. These very quickly turn into a sharp tactical advantage. If they take, they lose the exchange. So they had to trade the rooks here and not take. But now knight to d3. Again, tactics are eventually going to happen. Uh, if they take, they lose the rook on e1. So they have to move the rook. But now rook to c1, and we win the queen. Uh, black, I mean, white totally collapsed here instantly. And in this position, in fact, white resigned. This was Hikaru Nakamura with the black side. A beautiful illustration of how you can navigate these positions where they go for the overly aggressive b4 and immediate c5, where they commit their bishop to the queen side. They just abandon their king side, and that is uh, often proving deadly. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. A very simple one here, the bayonet. They basically have two options as a quick recap. They can go for c5, where we go for a very ruthless attack over here on the king side, or they can go for a more calm rookie one approach where their idea is to play more in the center. But as it turns out, what the, once the knight comes to e6, we trade it off. We have more pressure in the center than they do. And so we're the ones that end up building a stronger center. And this is what we're playing for. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Subscribe if you're new around here. Like this video if you learned something new from it. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.